Thank you um, very much for having me. You know, there's some rivalry between Strasbourg and Brussels, which is the real capital of Europe, and uh, I'm so glad that you said Brussels is the capital of Europe. <laughs> they are the seat. <laughs> A city's for people, and um, I really feel a little bit strange to be here with you because uh, it's not my first time in Oslo, but um, you know, I'm coming from Brussels, and all of you who have been in Brussels, probably you have noticed we have so many cars in the city, and you are talking about uh, a car-free uh, Oslo, and uh, when I'm walking around Oslo, for me, it's already car-free, uh, actually. <laughs> I'm just walking around to say, where are the cars? Where is the noise? So it's something very uh, strange, but anyway. Um, I just want to say, we are no hellhole, you know. You have an American guy at a reality TV star who is uh, running for president of the United States, and he has said he was 20 years ago in Brussels, and it was such a nice city, he said. And today, it's such a hellhole. What happened? I don't know if you have heard that after the attacks, he had said that. And just wanted to show two uh, pictures how beautiful Brussels is, and that we are not the Islamic state of ISIS, of Daesh. Uh, we are just a normal European uh, city with normal European people uh, and very international people living in. Just a quick introduction of, um, of Brussels. It's uh, a capital region. We are the heart of Belgium, also the heart of Europe. It's 1.2 million people every, who are living, actually, in uh, the region of Brussels, the city region of Brussels. It's uh, every day 400,000 commuters that will uh, come in. I'll come back on that later. We have 162 square kilometer, which is one third of your uh, um, area here in uh, Oslo. 12% uh, of our city is uh, green spaces. We have six police zones, it is five too much. Um, we are. <laughs> We are very international, we are the seeds of many things, we are the capital of many, many, many things, but we definitely are not the capital of the bike, and I will come back to that uh, later. So we have uh, 19 municipalities, and that's sometimes complicating my life. We, um, you know, Oslo, if I'm not wrong, you have uh, a density, population density of 1,400 per square kilometer. Um, in Brussels, it's uh, a, a bit uh, 6,200, which means that we have a big, much density of people. And if you actually look uh, to the cards and the colors that are on the cards, you will see that there are areas in the city we have more than 18,000 people living per square kilometer. And especially the one in the center there is with a lot of immigrants' population. It tends to be very immigrant, uh, um, yeah, people of immigrant background who live in highly dense uh, areas. Once again, some beautiful pictures of beautiful Brussels. Uh, we have to promote Brussels now. Uh, it's an official policy. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Basic mobility facts. One out of two of the people, one out of two of the people living in Brussels don't possess a car. More than all, half of the movements that are made in Brussels are for a distance less than five kilometers. Although 55% of them will be done by car. Only 4% of all the travels within Brussels will be done by bike. But there's something very interesting in the two other um, schemes that are on the slide. If you look at the in incoming and outgoing movements in Brussels, then you will see that the people who come into Brussels, the commuters, 64% of them will use the car. And um, a bit of, um, yeah, and you see there for public transport, and a very small amount uh, of uh, bikes and, and walking. But if you look on the contrary to the people living in Brussels, then you will see that uh, only, uh, that more than one out of three will only walk to make the movements, that public transport is much bigger, and that the car is uh, only one out of three of the movements. So that means that the mobility issue in Brussels is a commuter issue, and not really an issue of the people living in Brussels, although they could use more their bike too, but it's uh, not really an inhabitant issue, it's a commuter issue. So we have nearly 400,000 commuters every day coming in, in Brussels, of which 270,000 of them will every day, every single day, decide to come individually by their own car. And they are sitting there in their car. And why do they do that? A Belgian, his real dream is to have a kind of house in the countryside with a little garden, with a kind of wall around it, uh, and, and living in green. And um, so, Living in a city, we don't have these urban genes in a, in, in a Belgium. So the dream is to live on the countryside. And we have a federal policy, a tax policy, that stimulates living in rural areas. Although it's more expensive to live in rural areas for society, 
society will have laws that promote living in rural areas. Secondly, we have something very special in Belgium, that is company cars. Normally, I don't know, in Oslo, probably not in Norway, because you're very special on that issue, but in, um, in many countries in the world, you know, it's only the senior, senior, senior management that will get a company car. In Belgium, the junior, junior management will get a company car too, with a car to buy diesel. So, of course, people use their car. And why do we do that? Because it's a way of giving some salary, uh, salary extra and it's cheaper to do so. That, that's the reason why we still have many people coming by cars. Thirdly, we have a railway network, you know, maybe the Arrière or the S-Bahn in Berlin. Uh, we are working about that too for those who speak French of you. Arrière is a kind of express railway network. We call it Réseau Éternellement Retardé. <laughs> for 20 years we're talking about it. But now it's going to happen, they say. We'll see. Federal government. And we are a small country. Belgium is tinny, tinny, tinny. You take your car, one hour later you're in France, one hour later you're in Germany, and uh, not even one hour later you're in the Netherlands, and then you still have Luxembourg somewhere behind. This is a very interesting card. It's where the commuters live. And you see in the middle over there, uh, this very dark spot, that's uh, the Brussels capital region. And all the commuters, they just live around in an area of 20, 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers around Brussels. So if we had this real railway network, it would be very simple to uh, resolve our mobility issues. It's complicated. We have four public transport operators in Brussels. We have the TAC, it's from the Walloon region, Brussels depending on me, the LAN is the Flemish one, and the SNCB is the federal uh, uh, railway system. We don't have tariff integration yet, we don't have an integrated marketing of public transport, but we do have now one mobility card, it's called the mobile card with one uh, technology. We have nearly 365 million journeys only on the public transport of the steep of Brussels. That means a lot of journeys during a year, of which most of the people will, of course, take the subway system, also the tram system, and also the bus uh, system. So I'm not going to go in, into the figures. You can read it later. But um, you see, we have a lot of public transport that is developed in uh, the city. This is the regional es express network that should go out to the city to get people uh, into the city. This is that Donald Trump liked when he visited Brussels. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it looked like this. Um, you know, you see the cathedral there, you had all, everywhere cars. And Brussels in the past, and I should explain it to you, you know, in the 50s, when it was the after war, Belgium got a lot of uh, car plants coming to Belgium. And many European countries thought that the modernity, uh, development, going into the future, was investing in the car. And so this city, my city, opened itself for the car. And we built tunnels, we built flyovers, we uh, killed houses. Uh, literally, we done. We have demolished beautiful Art Nouveau buildings to join the so-called modernity uh, idea. And then we got this. But today, lucky for us, it looks um, uh, like this. And they're the same places as you saw uh, before. Uh, I'll do it again. You see all the cars, and now we have uh, much less uh, cars, and it has changed a lot. Uh, lots of trees uh, have come into uh, the uh, place. So why did uh, Brussels become a car-oriented city? I already told you, the 50s, the after World War period, modernism, the car industry, and also a weak city government that could not resist this temptation. I'm pretty sure that in uh, 10, 20 years, when people will look uh, into history, they will see what the hell have European and American cities have done. It was a big mistake to invest in cars in cities. And if you look what we are doing actually today is we are getting bikes back. At the end of the 19th, 20th century, the cities were full of bikes. We are getting tramways back. At the end of the 19th, 20th century, cities were full of tramways or streetcars. We are uh, reducing the cars exactly the same. So we are going back uh, to the past, which we call now the future, which is, I think, a good thing. <laughs> That's life sometimes. So, we want to change Brussels, and from a car-oriented city, we want to become a people-oriented city, as many Scandinavian cities have already uh, done. And we are not talking, I try not to talk about mobility when I'm explaining that to the people. Uh, I try to talk about accessibility, that's what is on the table, not mobility. Mobility is a mean, using a car, using a bike, walking, it's just a way, a mean of, do, of getting somewhere. And what it's all about, it's the goals. And we in society, especially social democratic politicians, I'm one of them, they try to, to confuse things. Uh, a mean, and especially trade unions, a mean becomes a goal. 
we should not talk about means, we should talk about goals. And the goal of a city of today is that people can find the space where they can interact. And the main function of a city is bringing people together, get interaction, get creativity, get economic uh, and cultural uh, development in a city. And that you cannot do in a city uh, where you only have uh, cars. I'm a biker myself, I'm a politician who practice what he preaches which is not always the case, neither in southern European countries. Yeah, here's a bit different, but in, in my area. So I bike a lot. And in the morning when I bike, I say hello to the people, and people say hello to me. You know how car drivers greet each other in the morning in Brussels? <laughs> and when two cars meet in the morning, what do you call that? An accident. It explains a lot, the way of thinking. So if we want to get less aggressivity in the city, if we want to get the quality of life in the city better and this function of meeting each other in a city, if we want to get the air quality better, because about the kids, about the asthma of the young kids growing up in modern European cities, then we have to redevelop our city to rebalance our city and I'm not against the car. I use my a car myself, although I have an electric car, but I use it once in a while only when I really need it. And for me, it's a question of solidarity. Because when everybody who uses not a car, when he has an alternative, he makes it easier for someone who doesn't have an alternative and is obliged to take his car to use his car. In a way, it's solidarity that is uh, playing uh, here. And if we redesign, rebalance our public spaces, our cities will become a better place uh, to come. And of course, um, you know, when we have to choose between uh, people coming into the city of inhabitants, we have to choose for the inhabitants and we have to choose uh, for uh, the people of the city. What are we going uh, to do? Brussels is going to, uh, well, you're not, still in, you're not yet in the euro. Huh? I hope you will be one day. We have 5.2 billion euros we are going to spend the next 10 years. It's budgeted. It's not politician talk. It's budgeted. We have the money. It is decided. The next 10 years, we will invest 5.2 billion euros in public transport in Brussels. We will get our subway system modernized. We have to change it, uh, the existing lines, but we are actually now building a new line uh, right through the middle of, uh, of the city. <clears throat> we are still investing in tramways too. We, have, uh, we are going to build a complex near the Hazel. Uh, we are building actually today two new uh, tram lines so that we have uh, much more people getting into a tram and we are redesigning our bus scheme and we will buy 235 buses. And we have decided that we will become all green buses. We will no longer buy uh, diesel buses, uh, only hybrid buses, 235. Uh, now we will buy them this and next year, and then it will only be electric buses in Brussels. So in 2025, 2030 at the latest, when you come to Brussels, it will be only electric uh, uh, buses. We are investing in a cycling uh, network for all of who, who wanted to have a real urban city testosterone uh, an experience in Brussels, go and bike in Brussels. Huh? And then you will have dangers sometimes, but we want bike lanes uh, like that all the time. We have people now, biking in the city, and who is biking actually today? It's young, urban, male professionals, sometimes with Lycra packs, sometimes uh, not, testosterone loaded, and they are driving like car drivers on the city, you know? Very often, cyclists in Belgium, in Brussels, will be a car driver on a bike. <laughs> that exists too. And all the rest has to go away, you know? Car driver on a bike, I'm here. <laughs> So we have to work on that. And the only way to get people more on a bike is to get separate protected bike lanes. We are going to build, and we are building actually right now, 80 kilometers of, um, of a kind of backbone system of uh, protected bike lanes uh, in Brussels along that uh, uh, model as you can uh, see it because we want women, families uh, on the bike and uh, we want from 4% to go eventually to 20% of the people uh, on, uh, on their bike. It's uh, very challenging, even today, I got on my Facebook, you know, uh, a message of someone and Flemish from Orange and you might know that the Flemish resemble like the Dutch and we bike a lot. Um, and even today someone wrote uh, a text on my Facebook messenger, go back to Flanders with your bike where you belong, you know. <laughs> People actually say that, you know. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs>
We are working also on uh, park and ride systems around the city, of course, 8,500, 10,000 even if we count everything we're going to build for 2020. It will be highly connected to the subway system or the tram lines so people can put their car and go on with public uh, transport. So we are working now for a new vision uh, for the city, lots more pedestrianized zones, squares, meeting places, and you see all the places in the city where we actually today are working on or the next years before 2020. This is Flagey Square, I don't know if some people know it. It used to be a square, as you can see there, at the right, a parking lot. Asphalt and only parking spaces. Actually, that's the reason why I went in politics, you know. I walked a lot in the city, and then I was always walking and saying, why the hell is this a parking place? Why don't they, don't they make a square? Why don't they take this? And then I had to cut the opportunity to get in politics and look like a nice square we have done. This is a square with all the Eurocrats go uh, and drink, you know, this very people, uh, highly paid, uh, overpaid people uh, in the European Union, uh, go and have uh, drinks. But it's also an area with poor people of uh, immigrants. They meet. You have old women sitting there nipping their coffee. You have young guys who are uh, smoking. Uh, uh, and it's all living together perfectly in harmony. You have kids who are playing. So that's how a square uh, should uh, be. It's a German who uh, designed it. The Reyes Viaduc is a flyover. You know, we have flyovers. We're going to get rid of all of the flyovers. If I had proposed this uh, 12 years ago, they would have locked me up in a lunatic house in Brussels. <laughs> Today, the people are waiting uh, because we have some other complexity with tunnels that are going down. Uh, we have to renovate them. Um, and we worked on it, and now it's so major change. It's possible. The city of Brussels, the city region of Brussels, has changed the last 12 years. Place Roger, the same thing. We are building it now, a bit too slow. Uh, but it's nearly finished uh, in September, and then we will have a nice car-free meeting space. Before, it was only cars that were parked on that uh, space right in the middle of the city. And this is um, another project. We have a congested shopping street today. We are going to uh, transform it to a car-free uh, street during day. During night, we will allow uh, car traffic uh, to pass on it. And a big surprise, the people who are living there, the shopkeepers, the local municipality, and me, we all agree. There is no fuss about it. And I will explain later on another case where people don't agree why this is this. Because we opened here a dialogue right from the beginning with everybody. We implicated people, and they are now actually, impli actually implicated in the design of the uh, square. We are building new parks, too, right in the middle of Brussels. You know, left is where you can see the, uh, how it is today, how it will be in uh, the coming uh, two years. Lots of green space. We will uh, even diminish the, the asphalt there on the new design. It will be much greener than it actually is on the squares. Another new square that will become uh, two other squares, car-free. We get rid of the cars. We give space to the people. You see beautiful examples. And now I come to the, uh, the real topic of uh, my presentation and why I uh, should have been here. Uh, I still have two minutes. Well, well, well. The car-free city center in Brussels. It used to be like this, now it is like this. This was a north-south traffic lane, uh, an X used by transit traffic. We decided to get it car-free together with the municipality of the city of Brussels. You see here the perimeter. Um, it's uh, a lot of things. We go from 28 uh, hectares today to 50 hectares uh, today also. Uh. It's uh, the, 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 the purple one is the extension, but you see that we have included the big lane uh, there, which is of of course, a major shift. And uh, it is, uh, this is the perimeter. This is how it is today, uh, how it will be in the next uh, two years. So no more cars, only people, only public space, only meeting space. Some more pictures, how it will be. That is just an impression. We are not going to do that. Huh? It's kind of balloon. Um, this is uh, how it will be. You see the difference. The ones who know Brussels, it's right near the Bourse, uh, where we all quiet after the attacks in Paris. People flock there to quiet, to celebrate. That's the, the place how it's going to be. This is the Bourse. Uh, you might have seen it on television. It will look uh, like this. Uh, yeah, there was uh, after the attacks uh, where the solidarity of the people were there. Same square, how it will all be uh, different. Now I'm coming to the advice. Still one minute more. I get two minutes, I guess. It's, um, I really believe, and this is a case that has been handled by the city of Brussels. We were involved too, but we were not the ones who were taking the, the first major responsibility. Well, the city of Brussels, they did it completely wrong. And I'm going to give advice how not to do it. Uh, that's a beautiful example how not to pedestrianize the zone. First of all, there was no communication with all the stakeholders, the shopkeepers, the visitors, the citizens, 
And maybe we had to decide it like that. I was agreeing with that, that we had to decide it. But from the moment it was decided, you should go in a dialogue with people and explain why and implicate them and be empathetic to them and listen to them. Not always agree with them, but at least explain to them why they are wrong so that they understand uh, the, the arguments. And that's a picture of the mayor of the city of Brussels. You know, non élu, pas le bienvenu. He was kicked out of a restaurant, which, of course, for a mayor is the worst thing can happen. Uh, if you are kicked out in your own city by uh, uh, a restaurant keeper, it happened to him. He is not popular uh, anymore. He wasn't before, but it's now neither. Uh, but um, he didn't handle it well, and that's, uh, that's an issue, I think. Secondly, you must tell a story. We live in an age of storytelling. If we want it or not, and I don't like it too much neither, but it's reality, the media loves it, it's storytelling. And that means that what you're doing is you have to need a strong identity. And once again, the identity should not be built on car free. The identity should not be built no cars. The identity should be built quality of life, better space for people, better place for meeting. That's the identity you want. You want happy people. And everybody, one way or another, is a car driver. And a car driver. And if you come, oh, we don't want cars. People say, what, what is that? Some loony greenie uh, who is uh, explaining something. Uh, we don't want it. I'm green too, uh, by the way. So social democratic and green goes together in Belgium. And so that's uh, another advice. Have a strong identity, a branding campaign, and explain. Use the website. Use Facebook. Use postcards. How it was before how it will become, make a kind of journal, how it is today and how it will be during the works. Um, and that's, I think, the most important advice is the project must unite and not divide people. You have two Facebook pages, you know, touche pas à mon piétonné, that means doesn't, don't touch my uh, car-free zone, and the other one says, I'm against the car-free zone. It's not good, because then you get division in a city. You get a kind of antagonism, and you get the kind of, uh, you know, united, you need unity. And of course, not everybody agree, but you need a, a uniting project. And especially in times as today, the project of, of, of getting quality of space in a city should not divide, it should uh, unite. Um, it's been said by Strasbourg too, go ahead with the project. Um, another thing that they did in the city of Brussels, I was absolutely against it, and they didn't want to listen. Uh, but, and they wanted to do it, they had a test period of eight months that, of course, became 14 months, uh, and then they are not even starting the works then, you know, and people say, what is this? And contrary to America, uh, where they are not used to a lot of things, um, we have uh, temporary things done in the street, and, and people thought it was a little bit too cheap, you know, uh, they want quality. So if they don't see the improvement very quickly, uh, then they will turn against uh, the, uh, I'm nearly finished, the project. And then, of course, reassure and communicate on the accessibility of commercial areas. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. Bold and visionary politicians are a prerequisite for change. And it seems like you're one of those. Thank you. Peter to Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Oslo, the car-free city centre, as it looks like in Brussels too, it's just a part of a bigger initiative. To, in Oslo, the, the, the aim is to reduce the overall traffic by 20%. Mostly, most of the discussion is about the, the car-free city centre, but I think this overall aim of 20% reduction, when even the population is increasing in Oslo, is far more uh, ambitious. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, you're is very... Is it possible? <laughs> no, I think you're very ambitious, and I think Norway is an example for us. I mean, we don't have to be, um, how I say, we don't have to be false modesty in, in, in Scandinavian countries like in Norway. I think you're way ahead for us for everything what is about climate and everything about looking into uh, uh, cities. I think that's, uh, that's a reality. And there's something what strikes me here, and it strikes me in other European cities too, is that there is a major change that is the, uh, like... Uh, he was telling uh, our friend from Strasbourg mm -hmm. that it's the younger generation. Yeah. I mean, the younger generation is the first generation that has been driven around. 
When I was a kid and I wanted to go to some place, it was very complicated to get to come some place. So we were longing to a car to get some place. Today, for the first time in America and Europe, but not in India, not in China, not in Brazil, but in America and in Europe, you have a whole generation of trend people who are now between 15 years, still 30 years, who decided that a car is no longer shaping their future, that a car is not necessary to have success in life, that it's not a way to seduce a girl or a boy, you know? That's <laughs> over. Huh? It's over. And uh, they have made their choice. And of course, the youth of today, it's a kind of butada. It's mm. the future of tomorrow. It's yeah. like that. Mm. And you mentioned before, the car companies, when you talk with them, if you talk with the guys of BMW, Audi, Volkswagen, uh, Mercedes, all these ones, Volvo, they all agree it's over the old mm. business model. And mm. that's the reason why they go in car sharing. And we live in an area where people want to share. You know, the sharing mm. economy is caring economy. And... Um, I strongly believe that this youth generation yeah. will make the difference, so I would make an alliance with them too, mm. because they fi finally, it's them who is going to elect the politicians of tomorrow. Yeah. And those are the people actually living in the city centre too, mostly. And they will come back in the city centre yeah. when you have mm. nice uh, yeah. pl places. Yeah. And also yeah. economically, it's difficult in Belgium and Brussels to explain too. You know, if you look into the world, Cities that thrive today are cities who invest in much more quality of life spaces mm -hmm. in the city. And that attracts young, creative, economically strong mm -hmm. uh, yeah. people into yeah. the city. And it gives also a cultural development because it's not about economics. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's about economics, but it's also about <laughs> cultural life in a city yeah. and meeting. So both will uh, strengthen when you uh, give uh, speech. And finally, we are human beings. We are designed for walking. Mm -hmm. We are not designed to be in a car. Mm. That's a good point. I have one, one very uh, <coughs> uh, precise uh, question from the audience. Why just electrical buses? Where does this energy come from, the elect electricity we produce in Belgium? Why not go for biogas-driven vehicles? Um, yeah, I will give you a political answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a little bit tricky. There are no journalists, I guess. They are not going to say it to Brussels. But oh, of course. we had a kind of this, this debate about it, and we just finally decided. And you know, because some people want not only biogas or, or, or CNG and you have all this kind of stuff, we decided not to do it because we analyzed all the public transport markets in Europe and nearly no new city is investing in it. Mm -hmm. Only the cities who already have gas buses will continue with that and most of them will go to hybrid buses or electric buses. And there's another reason, it's a bit of fear and I will be quite open, we are not one of these cities like you are also, also for other reasons who have been under uh, attack. And of course I know it's secure when you have a gas bus but, you know, having gas buses around a city in times of today, and if you have the right thing, you get a real bump. So mm -hmm. it's um, something that we decided not to do, and uh, we preferred electric. And, of course, we hope that in the future all the electricity will be green electricity. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a point. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's become yeah. green long electricity. Long term, of course, it will yeah, be. Yeah, long term. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it has to be. Okay, Pascal, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.